you would, um, some of you would be surprised. I don't think everyone would be surprised, but I think maybe, yeah, probably not a majority of you would be surprised uh, at how many times this week alone I was asked if I am going to get a zip line that runs from the top of that area here and zip line in and preach. And I'm just, you know, I'm like, look, that's just not the point of Sunday. Like, that's just kind of like taking the whole reason of Sunday away. But what I do Monday through Saturday, you just mind your, now if we get a zip line and we create a course in here and I fly around it, just, you can do what you do throughout the week, but if I want to zip line a little bit, I'll zip line a little bit. Amen? Amen. All right. We're in a summer uh, series. We're calling it Summer at Home Church. Uh, and this month alone, we're taking some different topics and we're looking at them uh, and looking what the Bible has to say about them uh, and how they apply to our lives. So we're taking uh, some topics over the next few weeks. Uh, we're looking at them, seeing what the Bible has to say about them, and then seeing how they apply to our life uh, today. So today we're going to be talking about this idea of dealing with disruption dealing with disruption. How, how many of you are easily distracted? Raise your hand if you're easily distracted. Where are you at? Easily distracted people. Okay, you can put your hands down. Where are my laser-focused people at? Like, nothing's distracting you. You're one-track-minded. Like, it's A, B, C, and nothing's going to stop you. No way in between. How many of you out of the mix um, enjoy Disruption. Raise your hand if you enjoy disruption. Okay, so not many hands there. Some hands, but not many. How many of you, whether you are a very focused person or not a focused person, how many of you are not, you're not, a, you're, you do not enjoy disruption? Raise your hand. You're, you just won't, don't want to be disrupted. Yeah, I think all of us um, kind of have that uh, nature in us that we don't really enjoy being disrupted. Um, one more question just to get things rolling here. Uh, how many of you realize that life is disrupting? Let me see your hands. Life is disrupting. Like it's just sometimes you'll be on one thing and out of nowhere something will come up. You'll be working on one thing, something will come out. And sometimes it's health things like you weren't planning on that. Uh, sometimes it's things with your kids, sometimes it's things at work, sometimes it's emotional things, sometimes it's stuff that you didn't even sign up for, and it just somehow, one way or the other, it brought you into the picture, and it brought a disruption. Uh, you can open up your Bibles all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there is almost not a single page that you can find where there's not something disruptive going on. And we live in a day and a society and a culture right now where there are a thousand things that are thrown, us, thrown at us each and every day. Uh, statistics say that on the average per, per day, 24-hour day, that we are marketed 5,000 times. Whether that's ads that you pass while you're on the, on the highway, whether it's emails that's sent to you, whether it's things and notifications through social media, there's all kinds of different avenues, and there's things that are coming that are trying to distract and trying to dis disrupt, and you cannot find almost a single page in the Bible where there's not a disruption or distraction that's going on. We see it all throughout the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles today, we'll be in Genesis chapter 12 to open up, and we're going to look at a couple different characters, but before that, let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and we just thank you for this moment uh, that we can gather today in your house God, thank you uh, for your idea of the church. Lord, you designed the church, the gathering, the body of people. And Lord, your word says that, uh, that you will build the church and that the gates of hell will not prevail. God, thank you for using the foolishness of preaching to build your church, to build your people, to build our faith. God, we know that your word says that without faith, it's impossible to please you. So today, we open up our minds, our hearts, and our ears. And Lord, we are expecting that our faith will grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Old Testament story of the nation of Israel even opens up uh, with a pretty distracting or disturbing uh, scenario. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, this is what God says to Abraham. He says, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country your relatives, your father's family, and go to a land that I will show you. How many of you would be disturbed by that? If God said, I need you to leave everything 
that is remotely familiar to you. I need you to leave your family. I need you to leave your childcare options. I need for you to leave the land that produces crops and different things that give you the ability to trade and the ability to buy and purchase. I need you to leave anything that is remotely familiar to you and I love this part at the end, and go to a place that I will show you. So you can kind of see the twofold disturbance here. You can see the twofold distraction here. God is saying, I want you to leave everything that is familiar, and I want you to go somewhere, and I'm not even going to tell you where it is. A lot of times, our minds, we want to operate in knowing that we're going from this to this. If I have this conversation, I need this to be the result. If we're going to do this, I expect this at the end. How many of you, you just think in a way that you, you desire to do something, and then there's a reward or a benefit or a f- fulfillment at the very end of that? And you see God from the opening pages in Genesis saying, I just need for you to step out in faith and take a step where you don't even know that you're going. How many of you have found that God will often do that to you in your life? He'll call you to take a step of faith, a leap of faith. He'll ask you to do something that to you it doesn't seem, doesn't seem at all safe. It doesn't seem at all like there's any kind of you know, assurance about it. But there's something about the nature of God that calls us to trust in him. In the Old Testament, we also see the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 20. This is Joseph's brothers talking about Joseph. They say this, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our, fa- our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. We're pretty familiar with the Bible story, Joseph the dreamer, and how he had this dream. And in this dream, all of his relatives, his brothers were bowing down to him that God was going to make him uh, this great person. And he has this dream and he goes and shares the dream with his brothers and his brothers begin this plot to kill him or to get rid of him or just to get him away from thinking so largely about himself. God gave him this dream. The Bible says that God gave Joseph this dream, and then he goes out and he shares it. And how many of you would think that there's a little bit of disturbance or distraction when Joseph has a dream and thinks it's going to go this way, and then the next thing he knows, he ends up in a pit. And then Joseph ends up going from that pit into slavery, from that slavery into a position of power, into that position of power, back to a prison. And there's all kinds of things about Joseph's story that it just didn't look like what God promoted it to be in the very front. But we notice that if we keep reading the story of, of Joseph at the very end of that, the story does come the same way and it comes full picture. But Joseph never imagined that he would have to go through all of the things in order to get there. And then once he did get there, I imagine that Joseph didn't think that it would look like how it looked like. Joseph was probably thinking, this is going to be awesome. My brothers are going to bow down. Woo, this is great. But when he's older and when he had been through the pit and when he had went through the betrayal and he had went through all of those things and his brothers bowed down, Joseph went from thinking, man, this is awesome, this is great, to thinking, these are my brothers and they're in bondage and they're in slavery and they're in famine and they need my rescue. I doubt that it was what Joseph pictured. We can see it even in the Old Testament uh, character of Moses. Moses was called to deliver God's people. There was something in Moses' heart. There was something in Moses' desire and his purpose that Moses wanted to deliver the people of Israel. And we can see that that desire, that one, even shows up uh, in the beginning of Moses' journey as he begins to deliver the people of Israel. There was what the Bible describes as someone who was over the Israelites, who was oppressing them. Moses sees this person oppressing his brothers or his family And Moses takes it into his own hands, and he ends up killing the person that was watching the Israelites. And when he killed them, Moses fled. He went on a run. He was in the wilderness for 40 years because he had to go through something in order to lead people through. But what Moses didn't know that God knew is that that wilderness experience that Moses had on his own for 40 years was going to equip him with everything that he would need to lead 1.5 to 3 million people out of wilderness. They were in bondage. They were going through the wilderness 
to a promised land. And we're talking about Abraham. We're talking about Joseph. We're talking about Moses. How does that apply to me? Have you ever thought that maybe life could look better? That maybe your relationship could look better? That maybe your marriage could look better? That maybe your parenting could look better? That maybe your life could look better? Maybe today you're here and you're, you're stuck in sin. There's something that you're addicted to. There's something that you're struggling with. There's something that you've been asking God, God, will you help me get free from this? And there's this picture, there's this glimmer, there's this hope, there's this expectation that God might set you free from that. There's this hope, there's this internal what if. That's the picture of a dream that God's given you that's on the inside of you. And we see that Abraham, it ended up coming full circle to him. Abraham was given the promise that your descendants would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And Abraham took God at that promise. We see God fulfilling his promise in Joseph. Even though it didn't look exactly what Joseph thought that it would look like, he still ended up coming through on his word. Moses, the same idea. I doubt that Moses really wanted to go through 40 years in a wilderness before he could lead uh, all the people of Israel out of bondage. Sometimes what's on the other side of what you're believing God for is a process. And that process is distracting that process is disturbing. That, uh, that, that process is something that we do not want to sign up for. We want to sign up for the promise. We want to sign up for the potential. We want to sign up for the expectation that things are going to be great. But we don't want to sign up for the process. God is a God of process. And if you don't learn how to deal with disruption, if you and I don't learn how to deal with distraction, we'll find ourselves, when all of these things come at us, blaming God. God, I thought you said. God, I thought it could be. God, if I went to church, God, if I opened my Bible, if I apologized to my spouse, if I cleaned up my mouth, if I did this, God, I thought that. But, but we don't want to go through the, the process of that. Abraham waited years to have Isaac. Joseph waited years before he saw the fulfillment of the dream that he had. Moses waited years until he was able to deliver people out of bondage. There's something about God that you cannot bypass process. If you want God to bring about all of those things that are inside of you, all the promises that he has in his scripture, I promise you, you are signing up for a process. Not only are you signing up for process, but you're signing up for pain. You're signing up for disturbance. You're signing up for distraction. You are signing up for a process that God's going to put you on, but he will bring about everything that he promised. He is faithful to his word. The Bible says that grass withers and that, flower, uh, that the flowers would fade, but God's word would last forever. And what is God's word? God promises us peace. God promises us salvation through Christ. God promises us freedom from sin and bondage. Those promises are in Scripture but there's always a process that precedes uh, there's always a process that precedes a promise for all of them dis uh, disruption was uh, not something that they had to overcome but it was something that they had to embrace for abraham for joseph for moses their process was something that they didn't overcome but it was something that embraced that they chose to embrace and then I, I wrote this down. This would be something for you if you're a note taker. Uh, we see a pattern in the Old Testament that God uses disruptions to shape our dependence upon him. God uses disruptions to shape and form our dependence on him. You, you, you don't have a need to be dependent on God if there's not a disturbance. You don't have a need to rely on God if, if all of hell is not trying to get you from walking into God's promises for you. Like, like you, there is no dependence on him. God desires that we would be dependent upon him for all things. We see it in the Old Testament uh, through the character of David. David obviously was on the backside of a hill given a promise that he would be king and we see throughout the Old Testament that Saul was given a pro uh, promise that he would be king, and he was king in a week. David was anointed to be king, yet it was a long time before David walked out his kingship. Why? Because God's not looking for somebody that can just say, ooh, I'm a king in a week mentality. I get anointed one day, I'm a leader one day, I'm a king in a week, everything's great. They would go on Oprah Winfrey and say, this is how I did it. This is what happened. Uh, here's my book. Here's my autobiography. I'm king in a week. This is a Saul mentality. The, the prophet Samuel went out. He anointed Saul. And ne the, the next week, 
Saul was king. But David went, he was anointed, and he went back to the field. Everybody wants the Saul kind of process. Give that to me. Give me the marriage fix in a week. Give me the sin uh, issue all figured out through a TED Talk that I can watch at YouTube in the comfort of my own home without telling anybody what I'm going through. Everybody wants that Saul kind of anointing, but no one's signing up for the David kind of anointing. The one that says that I'm anointed here, but yet I'm going back out to the field. I'm serving. I'm doing what I need to do. I'm going through the process. I'm doing this. I'm playing the harp. I'm getting spears thrown at me. I'm going through this. I'm taking my brother's bread at a war that I'm going to go out and I'm going to defeat Goliath. Like everybody wants the Saul kind of attitude. No one wants the David kind of heart. And we see it throughout David. David said, even this, he said that uh, when uh, he committed the sin with Bathsheba on his roof, he said, God against you and you only have I sinned. There are things in David's life that that David needed to go through in order to be the king that God called him to be. And what ends up happening is we all want to bypass a process. David went through it. Daniel went through it. There was societal pressures, and, and the king at that time was saying, uh, he had all kinds of advisors that were coming around uh, the king and saying, make sure that you have everybody bow at this time and pray to you and pray to our gods. And, and Daniel said, even though he was a captive in Babylon, he said, I'm not doing that. He said, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek Yahweh, the one true God. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to pray. And then in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 23, it says this, The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Daniel chose to go against what society was saying, and he said, I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to fast. I'm still going to search for God. I don't care what's going on in the community. I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care what's going on at the White House. I am going to seek and search for God. No matter what the world's doing, no matter what they think is popular, no matter what they're pushing, no matter the agenda, I'm going to go after God. And it, it ended up with him being in a lion's den. You and I would just naturally think that if Daniel is serving God's purpose, that why would he have to go through a lion's den? But look at what it says at the end of Daniel chapter 6 and 23. For he had trusted in his God. There's something about pain, there's something about process that stretches your trust muscle and your faith muscle in God, and no one bypassed it in the Old Testament. Why do we think that we can do it today? Nehemiah, the Bible says, just in the opening chapter, said that his heart was broken for the walls that were in Jerusalem. As he rallied the people and he went around and he looked at the potential of what could be the city of God, as he went around and he looked at the different gates, the different walls, he started strategizing, how can we do this? Who can work where? What's our timeline? What's our process? How are we going to get this city built back to its full uh, flourishing capabilities? How are we going to do that? That dream was in Nehemiah's heart that was given to him by God. He goes and the Bible says that at night he looks around, he begins working, he rallies the people. Guys, we can really do this. There's some potential here. If we would all come together, bring our resources, bring our talents, bring our gifts, God could really do something not for us but through us. There's the potential that God could do something awesome. We could build this wall. There's potential that this could be a great city again. No great thing is done without distraction or disturbance. The Bible says that Nehemiah and all of his other friends were on the wall, and there was Sanballat and Tobiah, if you're familiar with the story. They come up to Nehemiah day in and day out and try to talk him off of the wall. What you're doing, there's no purpose. It's just going to fail. You're never going to finish this wall. Jerusalem is done for. it. This city is done for. it. Your God is not powerful. You guys are doing nothing but wasting your time. You're wasting your time coming to church. You're wasting your time trying to read the Bible. You're wasting your time trying to apologize to your spouse. You're wasting your time giving to that church. You're wasting your time doing this or that. That's that sand ballot and Tobiah attitude that Nehemiah was dealing with. And Nehemiah uh, chapter 6 verse 9 says this, imagining, this is sand ballot and Tobiah, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. Notice what happens. So I continued the work with even greater determination, with even greater determination. In the face of Sanballat and Tobiah, imagining that they could discourage the work, this is Nehemiah's response. 
He said, I'm going to work with even greater determination. So what do you do when all of hell tries to attack you when you try to get closer to God? What do you do when society says you should do it this way or you should act this way or you should respond this way? What do you do when your flesh says, I really want to respond this way? I really want to act this way. Do, do, do you just go with the imagination of, yeah, there's probably no way that this is going to happen. There's no way that we're going to overcome this. Or do you stand like Nehemiah on God's word and say, I'm going to work with even greater determination. I don't know who's here today. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what your struggle looks like. I don't know what your pain looks like, but we all have pain. We all have discouragement. We all have setbacks. But can I ask you, can today be a brand new day? Can today be the day that you say, I'm go- even though all of this is going on, even though I'm facing all of this, I'm going to work with even greater determination towards blank. There's nothing that's going to set me back. I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not going to get distracted. Even though there's disturbance and there's distraction, how do I deal with that? David shows me how. Daniel shows me how. Nehemiah shows me how. Abraham shows me how. Moses shows me how. Joseph shows me how. It it shows me all throughout Scripture that there's no one who did anything great without distraction, without disturbance. There's nothing in the Old Testament, there's nothing in the New Testament that was accomplished of great significance without some kind of distraction or discouragement. So now we see this new pattern that God uses this pattern in the Old Testament, that God uses disruptions to shape our determination to partner with him in accomplishing his purpose in us. God has a purpose for you. Like, you're, you are not just a, a time space, uh, a time taker, a space taker. There's a unique purpose. There's a unique, a unique calling. There's a unique gifting that's on your life. But God is going to use pain in order to bring about his purpose. God doesn't use it. It's something that we go through. But the Bible says this, that those who love God and that are called according to his purpose, that he will be there and that he will faithfully steward you as you go through that. God's love for you is relentless. God's love for you is passionate. His desire for you to overcome and become stronger is greater than you could even know. So, Pastor, you're telling us about all of these characters. What does that look like? How does that apply? What, like, how, does, how, how do I work that? Jesus, in the New Testament, and even to this day, is our model for dealing with disruption. A major theme that we see all throughout the Gospels is disruption. Jesus disrupted the religious thinking of the day. The religious people that were walking around in Jesus' day were expecting some king to come in on a high horse and overthrow the Roman government. They weren't expecting a humble, lowly king to come and serve them. They, They weren't looking for that. Jesus disrupts religious thinking, and he's calling out those who seemed religious. He's calling them out saying that you say this, but you act this way. And Jesus is spending time with sinners. Jesus is spending time with bad people. Jesus is spending time with people who do not have it all together. That's not what the religious people wanted to see. That's not what they expected to see. They expected someone to come in that would just appeal to all of their desires and say that they're doing everything right. And Jesus comes in and says that you're doing everything wrong. There's nothing wrong with the law, but the way that you're using it and manipulating, that's 100% wrong because God is not about a religion, a set of rules, but he's all about a relationship with me and you. That's why he sent his only son so that we could have a relationship with him. He's purchased us. He's redeemed us. He set us free from sin and bondage so we can now have this relationship with God. But Jesus did not accomplish his mission without distraction. You cannot read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see Jesus not running into something that was trying to deter him from his purpose. Uh, You cannot read anything about the life of Jesus without seeing that he's constantly disrupted. There's constantly people needing something from Jesus. You see it all throughout the Gospels. Feed me. Heal me. Deliver my friend. Lay your hands on my friend. Come to this event. Like, the Gospels only account for three years in Jesus' ministry, 
In every page of the gospel, you see somebody coming and needing and pulling and desiring and trying to pull Jesus' attention away. But yet Jesus accomplished in three years more than all of us could accomplish in a lifetime combined. How did Jesus do this? How did he live a life that was disrupted constantly? All of these distractions that would come against him, not only from people, but you have to imagine every force in hell's power was trying to get Jesus off of his mission, was trying to get him distracted, was trying to get him not focused. Jesus dealt with disruption by living a prioritized life. That's how Moses did it. That's how Abraham did it. That's how Joseph did it. That's how David did it. That's how Daniel did it. That's how Nehemiah did it. That's how Esther did it. That's how Ezra did it. All of these characters that we see in the Old Testament, they lived their life and accomplished their purpose because they knew how to prioritize. This day and age, we do not know how to prioritize. That's a big theme that's going on in our life right now. Every struggle that you face, every issue that you have, I can almost nine times out of ten boil it down to a prioritization issue. You're not prioritizing and putting first things first. Um, I was reading in one of the leadership books um, that I read, and it talked about this idea of tears of effectiveness or tears of purpose. I want to share those with you. First of, one, first of all, tier one. Tier one of purpose. This is mission critical. Tier one is mission critical. This means everything rides on this. This is something that's extremely important. Tier two, this is very important or strategic. So tier one, this is, this is mission critical. Tier two, this is very important or strategic. Tier three, this is meaningful, but it's not vital or essential. And tier four is externally initiated or lower priority. So we have four tiers of how important something is or how much attention that we should give to them. I'll run through them one more time in case you're a note taker. Tier one, mission critical. That means everything rides on this. Mission critical to my life, to my work, to what God's called me to do. It's mission critical is tier one. Tier two is very important. Or it's strategic. These are good things. This is very important and strategic. It's just not mission critical. Tier three is this. It's meaningful, but it's not vital. It's something that's essential, but it's not obviously mission critical or strategic. And then the final one there is tier four. And it's externally initiated or lower priority. So... Okay, that's cool. How does that apply? Well, I'll walk you through it. For home church, like for our church, we just went over a sermon series that talked about our mission. We said that the mission of our church is to help people encounter Christ, experience life change, and embrace community. That's the reason that we're here, to help people encounter Christ, experience life change, and embrace community. That's the mission of our church. That's something that's tier one. How do we help people encounter Christ? It's a Sunday morning. It's right here. It's us sharing the good news of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and that no one gets to the Father except through him. It's mission critical that we share Jesus is the only way of salvation, and he gives it to those who freely ask. Freely ask, it's freely given. So we share that encountering Christ on a Sunday is mission critical. Experience life change, that's mission critical. Like Sunday morning, this is not a supper club. This is not us just gathering around and hearing some important words or hearing a, a good pet me up speech or hearing something that will tickle your ears or something that's good emotional charge. It's not about that. We're here to see people experience life change. We're not here just to point out three points in a poem and pat you on the back and say, hey, go get them for the rest of the week. We're here to say that there are people who are dead to sin, but Christ makes us alive. That's experiencing life change. That you don't have to live in the bondage that you're in. You don't have to live the life that you're living, but it only comes through Christ, and Christ literally has the power to change your life. I've, I've, I've experienced it personally. That's mission critical. Embrace community. The other day, I was just at uh, coffee with our city manager, 
And we were sitting down and we were getting ready to check out and uh, he tried to buy my coffee. And I said, unless you want to damage the mission of our church, get your card back in your wallet. Because it's the mission of our church to embrace community. To embr- like we were sitting down with the city manager. I was representing our church and how we could be more effective in the community and share Jesus in the community. And he's trying to buy his own coffee. Like I just told him that's a part of our mission. Put it back in your wallet. Like, that's mission critical to us. Embrace community. This is our city. We're not just going up to the splash splash pad because it's hot and we want to get our feet wet and we love Phil's hot dogs. We're not just going up there for that. We're going up there because this is our city. God's put us here and we are called to serve and love this community. Home groups aren't a good idea just so you can sit around and have friends. Home groups are mission critical so you can get around people that have been through life, that have been through and have made some mistakes have, and that have had some up and down. It's mission critical. Now, what's, what's tier two? What's something that's very important or strategic? The building, like the lobby, that's important. The hallway, that's important. It's just not mission critical. It's, it, it's very important that we create a place for people to experience the mission, but it's not the number one thing. So it helps us shape our priorities. Tier three is something mean, meaningful, uh, but it's not vital or essential. Um, like for us, like we're not like, ooh, we have this car show every summer because we want to raise money for blank, a good cause. Like that for us, that's meaningful, but it's not vital for us to help people encounter Christ, experience life change, and embrace community. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But it's tier three as far as how effective it is. Tier four, this is externally initiated but lower priority. Like for me, as I'm trying to prioritize my week, uh, there's a guy that lives behind us. We own 12 acres of land, and the guy that's back there, he wants to buy a piece of it. My focus isn't on that. My focus is on feeding the sheep this week. Like, my focus is study, so I don't have time to look at maps and do all that and get him pricing and do, like, I, I've just learned this is my mission, and that falls in a tier of effectiveness for me. What does it look like for me? Like, we, we're talking about these different tiers. We talked about how the church has it. What about, like, for, for me personally, I'm a Christ follower. I'm a Christian. I love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul. I love God. That's who I am. I am a Christian. I'm a husband. And I'm a father. Val is the greatest gift that God's given me. And aside from that is Amos. Those are my two most precious things in the world. That's a tier one for me. That's who I am. That's my mission. I'm also a pastor. I'm a shepherd. God's called me to help people take, take next steps. And if I do that from this stage, or if I do it from a coffee shop, or if I do it in Walmart, it doesn't matter. God's called me to help people take their next step in their relationship with Christ. So I know what my mission critical thing is. The next one's very important. I'm a friend. But if my tier one stuff takes priority over my friendships, it has to. Tier three, this is meaningful, vital, uh, or, or essential. I'm a helpful hand. Like, I'm not the greatest remodeler, but I can get a couple things down. I can, I can paint. I can do this. I can, like, I can help. I can move boxes if you're moving. I can do that stuff. But it falls in a line of priority. Tier four, this is just something I like to do. I like to hunt. That's fun for me. I like to golf. Uh, I I like to do that. Like those are just, it's tier four things. They're not bad things, but they're not priority things. But what ends up happening is in relationships that we have, we take something that's a tier four and we supersede a tier one. My golfing and my hunting does not come before my wife or my child. You see how people get this backwards? And the Bible shows us Moses, Abraham, David, Daniel shows us how they prioritize and we can see how to prioritize through scripture, but anything out of order, you'll lose it. Like you put video games before your wife, you put this before your job, you put this before your, like the Bible says in Matthew chapter chapter six to seek first the kingdom of God. We have to learn to have our priorities. What does Jesus's priorities What does Jesus' priorities look like? First of all, I mean, we see that Jesus said his top tier priority, what's mission critical for Jesus? He said, I must be, I must be about my father's business. There's no suggestion there. There's no willingness to play there. It is very serious. Jesus says, I must be 
about my father's business. In John, there's a story of the woman at the well. The Bible says this, that Jesus had to go through Samaria. So Jesus must be about his father's business. That's mission critical. Jesus had to, that's tier two. And then it says, number three, uh, when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, he asks his disciples this question, where can we buy bread and food for all of these people? It's not mission critical, but it's something good. It's something helpful. And then we see um, uh, at the story of when Jesus uh, was at the wedding in Cana, uh, Jesus answered his mom and said, dear woman, this is not our problem, which means that Jesus was like, yeah, I'm cool. I'm here at the wedding. I'm enjoying this. This is a good time, but this is not my problem. So today, the idea that we're talking about, that we're focusing on, is dealing with disruption, dealing with distraction. And for me and you, when it comes to life, when we look at Jesus, when we look at our life, we have to realize that disruption is and will always be a part of our life. You're never going to sidestep it. You're never going to get away from it. The best thing that you and I can do is learn how to prioritize it. It looks like hard work. It looks like taking out a notebook and talking and thinking through what is the most important thing in my life. And the f- number one thing is your relationship with Christ. I love Val, but I'm not good to her if I'm not, if I'm not good with God. Because I know myself away from God and it ain't pretty. My relationship with Christ comes first. My relationship with Val, if Val called me right now, I was like, hey, like, I love you, let's go on a date. I'd be like, look, I love you guys, but like, you guys are going to have to figure out the clothes because I'm out of here. She's mission critical. Like, to me, that's important. If, if Amos woke up and was like, dad, dad, ball, I'd be like, hold on, let me close this real quick and then we can go. But at the end of the day, we'd still be doing that. But what ends up happening is li- in life is I don't know about you, but you might be thinking about your spouse. You might be thinking about a coworker that gets things um, out of order. But can I tell you, you and I, we're just as guilty. And it's something that we're not constantly focused on, but it's something that we should draw our attention to periodically and probably more often than not. And I just want to ask you this question, like, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you about your priorities today? I want you to ask yourself this question. Have I really been putting God first in every area of my life? Like the reason that we come to church on Sunday is because it's the first day of the week. We're giving God our first. We're giving him our best. What area in your life are you not trusting God with? And the way that you can tell if you trust God with it is, are you giving him that first? Not if you're giving it to him in an afterthought. Like, like, Church is, is priority. It's, it's the start of the week. Me reading the Bible, it's the first thing that I do when I get up because I want to spend time with God. He's my priority. And I'm not saying that you, you have to do this or you have to add this to your repertoire, but ask yourself, what area in my life is God not first in? Is he first in my marriage? Is he first in my workplace? Is he first in my finances? Any, anywhere in your life that God is not first, I promise you there's chaos. I, I know there's stuff going on in there. But when you and I can learn to get to a place where we're trusting God with the first, giving him priority in everything, we'll find God fulfilling that purpose that he's promised us. Will you stand with me today? Many of you here today, you might be thinking, You know, I've got this disruption in my life. I've got this disturbance in my life. I've got this distraction. And and there's a plethora of answers. Like, they're long and they're wide. And and there's so many across the room today. There's somebody today that's dealing with the disturbance of a health issue. There's somebody today that's dealing with the disturbance of some kind of emotional thing going on. There's someone that's here today, you're dealing with some kind of distraction for something that's going on in work and it's overwhelming you. There's, there's somebody here that you're dealing with something that you, you've just, you're overwhelmed and you don't know what to do with it. All of us have these distractions. All of us have these disturbances. My question today that I wanna close with is, 
what are you going to do with it? Is it something that you can trust God with? Is it something that you can be like Abraham and say, God, I don't know where you're taking me, but I'm going to put you first and I'm going to follow you. Is it something that you can be like Moses and say, God, I know that you have this purpose in me, but I know that I have to go through a process in order to get there. Is it something maybe you're in a position like David was where David saw Saul, that's weird to say, he saw him get anointed and become king in a week. And maybe you're sitting there like, why am I still doing this? Why do I feel like I'm still at this entry level? Can I promise you that God has you on a plan and a purpose? He knows exactly where you are if you'll lean into his process. There's things, God is a master carpenter at whittling things off of your life that are distractions, that are discouragements. And he knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you need. He knows the situation that you're in. He knows exactly what you're facing down to a T. And it might not be the most pleasurable thing, but God in his all-sufficientness, in his mercy, in his grace, in his loving kindness, he knows exactly what he's working out in us. And I know this, that God says that he'll work all things together for the good of those who love him and that are called according to his purpose. So today, Father, we just come to you. And God, we know that we face distractions. We know that we face discouragement.